So let's start by looking at a single heating loop, and we might call that a heat pump. So if you remember from our split air conditioning discussion where we looked at a simple single loop cooling system, we had a vapor compression cycle that used an evaporator and a condenser to cyclically phase change refrigerant, absorbing and kicking out heat energy from a zone to the outside. Well, a heat pump can do that as well as reverse the refrigerant flow to accomplish heating. So it seems counterintuitive, but the way that the refrigerant loops are designed in a heat pump, there's enough heat energy outside where the refrigerant can evaporate and absorb that heat energy and that kick that into a zone where you have a heating load. So we're essentially reversing the role of the evaporator and the condenser. So there's a few ways that you can tell if the device you're looking at is a heat pump because the equipment looks very similar. So you can tell from the nameplate if you have some type of heating BTUH that would indicate that you have a heat pump that can accomplish both heating and cooling. Or you, you can look down into the condenser assembly and you might see something like this, which is called a reversing valve. So it's essentially a, a manifold valving device that allows for that reversing of the refrigerant flow but keeps the vapor compression components in the proper order. But a lot of typical heating configurations in commercial HVAC are going to be leveraging some combustion process. And there's a couple flavors of that. So the next simplest would be a furnace or a simple air handler that has a, a gas-fired oil or natural gas air-to-air -air heat exchanger. What we may see in larger systems is a hot water boiler that uses an intermediate loop or a hydronic water loop to take water from an air to liquid heat exchanger at the boiler to some coil or some heat exchanger at or near the zone. And then going one further complexity, we'd have a steam boiler where we're actually leveraging phase change to and from steam from liquid water to maximize the amount of heat exchange that we can have in a given combustion process. So the gas-fired air handler or furnace is going to be something that you might recognize from a small office or maybe in your home with a furnace. And here you can identify with gas going directly to these units. You can see on the nameplate what type of capacities that you have involved. And these are going to be for smaller heating applications. And here you have an air-to-air -air heat exchanger with combustion gases on one side and the air going to the zone on the other with a fan being blown across that heat exchanger. So the hot water boiler is going to have the same combustion process on one side of the heat exchanger, but on the other side is going to be that liquid hydronic loop. So this could be anywhere from 180 to in condensing boilers down to 100 degrees or so, and that's going to be passing that to some heat exchanger, whether it's uh, a, a radiator or a coil or underfloor heating, somewhere where you can accomplish convective or conductive heat exchange to address the heat load in your in your zone from the conductive losses in the walls and the windows or addressing the ventilation heating requirements from cold air outside. And there's two types of boilers that you may see here just to be comfortable with the geometry and it depends on the shape of the heat exchanger inside the boiler. So on the top where we see the combustion gases going through individual tubes and we see water on the outside we would call that a fire tube boiler and on the bottom picture where you have that rectangular boiler water is going through the tubes and we would call that a water tube boiler. So there's some specific infrastructure that you need in a hot water system. We're going to go over it in more detail in the pumping videos but just to call out a few that are specific to hot water systems, we have an air water separator that might be at the inlet or near the boiler, and that's going to try to extract whatever entrained air they can out of the hot water system. It's also the makeup point for water. And then with the expansion tank, that's going to be a device that has some type of air bladder inside and is meant to take up the extra volume when the water heats up. So water is incompressible but it does change density at different temperatures. So as you heat it from startup to up near 180 or 200, as hot as it goes, it's gonna expand and the job of the expansion tank is to take up that additional volume. So why might you want to use steam versus hot water? 
Well, like we saw with the cooling system configurations, you're able to move a lot more heat energy with a phase change. There's a lot of energy piled into that latent phase change process. So just to kind of throw some numbers at that, let's say we had 10 million BTUH that we wanted to accomplish with a hot water system. Well, using this equation for heat exchange with water at typical HVAC conditions and saying that we wanted to meet that 10 million BTUH load, we'd probably be supplying water at about 180. It'd probably be coming back about 160, so we'd have a delta T of around 20. That would put the flow at 1,000 gallons per minute. We'd probably put a line size of 8 inches or so to supply that. We'd also have a return, so we'd have two of those lines. ASHRAE would probably tell us to insulate it about an inch and a half. And then comparing that with steam, we have this mass flow equation. So we can't look at just delta T with a phase change, so we look at delta enthalpy and then the pounds of steam moving across that system per hour. So again, to meet that 10 million BTUH for an apples to apples comparison, and using a, a typical delta H of 1,000 BTUs per pound of steam, we'd have a mass flow of 10,000 pounds of steam per hour. That might require about six inch supply line for steam. It'd be up near 240, so we'd see a lot more insulation. We'd have some condensate, so once the steam condenses in its load coil, we'd see about uh, we'd see some type of water coming back to the system. So let's say it's 20 GPM, which would require a line size of maybe an inch and a half. That water's still going to be pretty hot, having just condensed from steam, and then that's going to require about a two inch insulation line. So these are the kind of infrastructure and first cost decisions that may go into determining whether you would have a hot water or a steam system. Of course, if you have a hot water or a steam network as part of a campus or installation, that's going to determine what, what ends up getting put in, whether it's a hot water converter or steam directly to your coils. But the steam boiler itself can look very similar to a hot water boiler. So in this picture, if you look at it, there's a couple clues that will tell you which one is the steam boiler and which one's the hot water. I'll just go ahead and spoil it now. You can see at the top here, you have that equal line size going in and out of the boiler. So that's your hot water supply and return going from and to the boiler. And on the bottom, you don't see that equal line size. You see more of, off to the top right there, a steam supply manifold. And that's, that's kind of one telltale sign. But more importantly, and, and one of the things that we want to point out with this video is that you know, there's special infrastructure with steam that you want to take note of. And the first thing that you're going to need with steam infrastructure is these steam traps. So the job of the steam trap is to take any leftover steam or water vapor and condense it back to water so that it can be gravity fed to a tank and then pumped back to the boiler. So ideally, you're going to have full condensation of your steam in a coil so you can extract as much energy as you need out of there. But depending on how the coil was sized, or if you have variable loads across your coil, you might not condense all of that steam. So just to show what a steam trap should look like when it's working, very hard to tell just from taking a peek at it, but with something like an IR camera or an IR gun, you can see these temperatures that operate on either side of the steam trap. So is the steam trap working? Well, what you can see on the right here is the steam side, and that's kind of up near that 270, 280 degrees that you might expect with steam. And on the left side, you see it drop down to the 200, and that's going to indicate that you've had that phase change. So, since, so we want this phase change here. We don't want steam entering our condensate line. So this is a, this is a properly working steam trap. And this is what it might look like if you have a steam trap that's stuck open, where you have steam sneaking past into the condensate return. And this could happen for a number of reasons. It might be dirt. It might be some kind of pressure surge that damages the components. It could be missized so that steam can sneak through. So why is that bad? Or what's the implication from steam getting into your condensate return? Well, the other component that you have to have in a steam system is your condensate tank. So condensate is gravity fed back to this tank, and there's a opening with the atmosphere in this tank, 
And if you have steam leakage, you might actually see a little bit of steam coming up from this tank that would indicate that you have some steam trap failures. But the job of this condensate tank, you don't want to lose steam out of it. You want to take the, the water back and then it would get pumped up through the boiler, turned into steam through the cyclical process. So if you're using a lot of makeup water or you see steam at your condensate tank or through an IR gun or IR camera, you can see that you're having steam sneaking past your steam trap. This would kind of indicate some low-hanging fruit to try to repair the steam system. So there's a lot more complexities than we're hitting here. I've linked some additional material that uh, you may want to watch to get a little more in-depth with steam components and operations. There's a lot of applications that we may have, but for right now we're going to focus on hot water boilers and we're going to ask the question about what makes a boiler a condensing boiler.